Hello and welcome to the seminar and lecture series. Uh, I am Sarthak Bakchi and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this edition of the seminar and lecture series. Uh, we have with us today a very exciting uh, lecture by Professor Tarun Chauradeep, uh, who is going to speak to us about uh, a, a very interesting space mission uh, for uh, which will which will talk about uh, the uh, CMB, which is the Cosmic Microwave Background, and more on that will be explained to you uh, when we move ahead with this lecture. But before that, uh, I would just like to explain a little bit about uh, the seminar and lecture series and uh, how we are uh, how we have envisaged this uh, as as a platform for uh, interaction and engagement uh, with really a highly reputed scholarship and distinguished scholarship. Uh, at Ahmedabad University, we believe very firmly in the ideas of uh, project-based learning and also practically application of uh, whatever is learned uh, from, you know, uh, from theoretically in the classrooms. Uh, and with keeping that in mind, we also uh, encourage uh, our students to get to interact with the uh, distinguished scholars across the world uh, so that they can interact and learn more about how to make practical application of what they are learning uh, in the field or, or in the classroom. Uh, and with keeping that in, in, in mind, we had envisaged this kind of a platform of the seminar and lecture series where we uh, invite distinguished scholars from across the world and across different disciplines uh, to come and interact with the faculty members uh, and students uh, at Ahmedabad University. And uh, we are pleased that uh, during uh, the pandemic, during this webinar format that we have taken for the series, uh, we have been able to extend uh, our range of audience and uh, interactions uh, across multiple disciplines, across multiple geographies, uh, and across multiple institutions, and not just restricted to the students of our own uh, university. And uh, with that, uh, I would now like to uh, invite you to, uh, I would like, now, like, now like to welcome you uh, to this lecture. Uh, and we have with us uh, a PhD student, uh, Kaushiki Bhattacharya, who will now be introducing uh, today's speaker uh, for you. Kaushiki, thank you. Professor Tarun Saradeep is the chair of physics department and the data science department at the Indian Institute of Science and Education and Research, Pune. Prior to joining ISAR in 2019, he was on the faculty of the Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, IUCA, at Pune for two decades. Professor Saradeep obtained a bachelor's degree in engineering from IIT Kanpur. After a short while in automobile designing, he subsequently decided to pursue a master's degree in physics and a PhD in gravitation and cosmology at IOCA, followed by postdoctoral research in Canada and the United States. At IOCA, he built and led a cosmology subgroup of my cosmic microwave background studies Saradeep led the sole Indian group within the international team of the Planck CMB space mission of the European Space Agency. His contribution to science has received international recognitions also. He was elected a fellow of the International Society on General Relativity and Gravitation in 2013 and is a co-recipient of the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics 2016 and the Gruber Cosmology Prize 2016 for the discovery of gravitational waves. He is also a recipient of a number of awards in India, including the Swarnajanti Fellowship, the NASI Scopus Award, the BM Birla Prize, and the Vikram Sarabhai Research Award. Professor Saradeep is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences, India. He serves as the spokesperson for the LEGO India Mega Science Project for the construction and operation of a gravitational wave observatory in India. I'd like to invite Professor Raghavan Rangarajan for further furthering the meeting. Thank you very much, Kaushiki. A warm welcome to all of you and to Professor Tarun Saurudeep. As Kaushiki mentioned, Professor Saurudeep has spent decades coming up with ways of learning more about the universe. And he has done that by studying the cosmic microwave background. If you point a detector in any direction in the sky, away from any known source of electromagnetic radiation, like stars, you will detect electromagnetic radiation in the microwave wavelength uh, range. Because this comes to us from all directions, this is referred to as a cosmic background. The cosmic microwave background was first detected in 1964. And since then, we've been studying it to learn more about the universe. 
In the early days, we used earth and balloon based detectors. But in the last few decades, sophisticated instruments on satellites have been giving us more and more accurate data. By looking at correlations in the cosmic microwave radiation coming to us from different directions in the sky, we have learned much about the history and present composition of the universe. Indian scientists have proposed a satellite mission in collaboration with the European Space Agency. The mission is called CMB Bharat, and it can tell us even more about the early universe. Professor Tarun Sarudeep has been leading the effort to mobilize the Indian scientific community uh, behind this project and engaging with ISRO to see this come to fruition. Therefore, we are indeed very pleased to have him he here with us today. Without further ado, I will therefore welcome him to deliver his lecture on CMB Bharat, Quest for the Cosmic Origin. Professor Saradeep, over to you. Thank you, Raghur. Thank you, Kaushiki, uh, Sarthak. Uh, thank you for the very warm welcome. Uh, it's always a pleasure for me to speak uh, to students and I'll uh, tell you why in a minute when I get to my talk. You see the word quest and you know so that uh, you know every scientific career has some way of uh, finding a niche and I find uh, the word quest uh, a very important thing to include in the scientific enterprise because quests of uh, you know, for something grand, some scientific goal that you expect uh, or scientific result you expect to find, just like the Higgs boson uh, and, you know, the gravitational waves. These are a unique way of bringing not only science, but also science uh, and technology together. It also brings in this feeling of doing things in a very collaborative fashion, because none of these, or many of these, most of these quests um, of this generation are no longer things that a single group or a single person can be doing. It's typically done in, uh, as a part of a huge uh, effort that involves a lot of uh, apparatus building, as well as a lot of analysis, a lot of things. So. This has been something that uh, over the last decade has been one of my passions of even a more than a decade. And so I will be talking about one of the quests, uh, which is coming up in the future. So something up uh, sometime later this decade, late this decade, or even um, early next decade, or, you know, with quests, you never know how long it would take. Uh, and this is the quest to understand the very origin of the universe. Okay, so this is, uh, there are two parts to my talking about quests uh, in this context. There are quests, of course, uh, these are global quests. Every scientist in the world would like to see these answered. But nevertheless, uh, I am focusing on areas that are now possible to conceive doing in India. And so my sort of, uh, main goal is to invite young people, young minds to consider the possibility that they would be spending their careers pursuing a quest. And literally, it almost takes a uh, scientific lifetime for many of these quests. So uh, as people told you that uh, I also represent the LIGO India project, but that's a project which I started uh, pursuing uh, more than a decade back. And actually we put in a, a proposal, uh, sorry, uh, in 2011 for building a gravitational wave observatory on Indian soil. As you know, similar observatories in the US uh, made the first discovery of gravitational waves. And uh, so of course you might wonder why did we you know, pursue something where the discovery is going to happen. We even knew when we were proposing it uh, that we may not be uh, running when, uh, you know, before, in time for a discovery, but our goal has been to enable something very exciting with these 
detections, and that is to enable astronomy and astrophysics to gain from this. So multi-messenger astronomy can be enabled uh, only with a global network of detectors, uh, which would include uh, LIGO India detector, which is already underway. And, you know, so we have the site and it's in the construction phase. And I think um, now that I'm talking to students in the undergraduate, I would like to invite them to something exciting, which is next, right? This is already something that we are on to ongoing. And that is another window, uh, you know, involves another window to the world of gravitational waves, the you know, probing the universe in gravitational waves. So the window that has opened currently in 2016 are, uh, is this with the LIGO detectors. And uh, as I said, one of them would be coming up in India soon. And these detect a particular range of frequencies of gravitational waves. So just like the electromagnetic spectrum is rich in phenomena at different wavelengths. So you have radio waves, you have optical, UV, X-ray, gamma ray. Similarly, gravitational waves, there's this window which has opened up where we are seeing black hole mergers almost routinely now. And then there would be another window opening up uh, in 2030, or maybe 2035, with the launch of the laser interferometric space antenna which has a much bigger baseline on which laser light is exchanged. And this will detect sources with minutes to hours uh, of time period, which would involve uh, white dwarf binaries, other binaries or small black holes falling into massive black holes, very massive black holes. Then there's another window which is yet to open up and, you know, uh, if, if you had followed what has happened in the American Physical Society meeting this time, one of the groups uh, doing this pulsar timing experiments, which is a you know, global effort involving radio astronomers with uh, the biggest radio astronomy facilities, monitoring pulsars as clocks, you know, uh, whose jitter will point to existence of gravitational waves on those year to decades uh, time period. And these are signatures of supermassive black holes colliding, uh, coalescing into each other. So it's a completely new world that will open up there. Okay. And that again is uh, with uh, at APS, although there, was, uh, there wasn't a discovery announced, there was some kind of a teaser to very, very interesting possibility that there is already uh, such gravitational wave background being uh, seen in the data. My focus is on the gravitational waves of the longest wavelengths conceivable, which are almost the wavelengths comparable to the observable universe. And on time periods, of course, of the age of the universe. And uh, from, we believe, arising from moments after the creation of the universe or creation or what we think is was the moment of Big Bang. Big Bang is kind of a hypothetical extrapolation to the past where we think it started all from a point. But, you know, so this is something very close to that. Uh, as I had said in my abstract, uh, atto of an atto second, so 10 to earth minus 35, 36 seconds uh, from the, uh, you know, what would be called Big Bang. Okay, and there's something unique about this window of gravitational waves and these this signals. These signals, uh, the way we predict them is using quantum physics. We use, we use quantum, uh, quantum field uh, calculations on curved space uh, time, that is the universe on the background of the universe and very rapidly expanding universe. And we believe that these originated from quantum phenomena. So these will be waves of truly, uh, you know, quantum origin. And hence, just like we started the whole effort on uh, for LIGO India, uh, we started it with by building a consortium of scientists and technology people, uh, you know, uh, to 
build a community that would promote this idea of uh, detecting gravitational waves uh, with LIGO detectors. Uh, there was a consortium called Indigo. Similarly, in 2018, we set up a consortium of Indian cosmologists who I hope, uh, you know, uh, the generations uh, would uh, pursue this really, really prized goal. Okay. So let me tell you why it is prized. And most of my lecture would be trying to tell you why it's so important and why this seems to be the last bit of the puzzle in understanding our universe. Okay. So as you know that the universe is extremely fascinating. I mean, I hardly know of anyone who is not already fascinated by the universe. But if you are not, I mean, such pictures should uh, really encourage you to get fascinated. So this is a picture of the Milky Way reflected in a lake and it's a very beautiful cosmos. So there's so much out there. Now, this is what we see is necessarily just our backyard. This is our own galaxy mostly. All the stars are in a, our own Milky Way that you see here. But suppose we were to look away from this plane of the Milky Way in a dark spot of the sky, okay? Uh, where you don't see anything, okay? And as Raghu said, if you peer in this region, of course, you'll see something called the cosmic macro background. But even if you peer at something where you don't see obvious stars, but when you look in optical with the most powerful telescopes and zoom out, you will see something like this. This is a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope which stared at a dark spot of the sky. And you can see the our universe is full of galaxies all the way that we can look with light. You know, so there are galaxies so distant from us that we are seeing them as they are just forming. You should realize that another amazing thing in cosmology as well as in astrophysics, you realize that you don't see phenomena instantly. As I see something far away, the fact that light takes some time to come to us becomes more and more important. So we see things in, as they were in the past when we are looking at distant objects. So when we are looking at a very distant galaxy like this splotch here, okay, it looks like a splotch. You wouldn't even think it's a galaxy. It's actually a galaxy, but it looks like a deformed splotch because it hasn't had time to form yet. They are just forming. So as far as we can see in the universe, into the universe, the universe is full of galaxies. And we would like to understand what is the context in which, what drives the dynamics of this universe? How does this evolve? What phenomena underlies it? And we want to have an understanding. And I think it's always humbling to me um, that you know, sitting on this tiny speck of dust in the middle of nowhere in the universe, uh, we have been using, you know, basically our, you know, what I would say human intellect and, uh, you know, technology to be able to infer so much about the world around us going back billions of years. Okay. So the story starts, as I said, the un universe, as we look out, seems to be full of galaxies and each galaxy itself is a massive object. But uh, so, so massive that it takes about 100 uh, years, 100,000 years, sorry, for light to traverse across a galaxy, right? So galaxy is that big. And there are about 100 billion stars in a galaxy, at least, you know. And you should realize that these are huge objects by themselves. But on the cosmic scales, these are like speck of dust, okay? So when I look at, understand the fluid flow in a room uh, using, you know, dust, you know, if your ray of sunlight comes through, you can see dust particles dancing around. And if they're all moving in one direction, you know there is a breeze, right? But you are not really concerned there with the structure of each dust particle, okay? You're using them to trace the dynamics of the air in the room. Similarly, we use the galaxies that we can see everywhere and you know, to trace the dynamics of the universe. 
Okay, how is the universe evolving? Okay, the fact that the universe is evolving itself is a big surprise, right? And I'll tell you how big a surprise it was. So if we see our universe around us, of course, uh, if we are at the center of this distribution, this cloudy structure that you see around us are actually clumps of galaxies. These are super clusters of galaxies and, you know, so clusters of clusters of galaxy, right? And the nearest one is Virgo, then there's this famous Coma, Hercules. So this is like the local map of the distribution of matter around us. And you can see that it's not a very smooth distribution, it's pretty lumpy and it's got some structure in it, right? So it's really something to ponder over. It's like if you're a condensed matter physicist and you saw a phase of matter where there were interesting cellular structures and you try to understand what forces drive it, what, what really happened, right? So this is the universe we would like to understand. And if I really sort of zoom through the universe, this is a nice uh, animation of uh, uh, flying through the universe, right? And you can see the galaxies, but they are not uniform in the sense they are in some network and you know rich structure of, you know, so we, it seems we are going through some spongy structure in the distribution of matter as we traverse through the universe, right? And typical volume of the universe looks more or less the same everywhere, which is a very important part, okay? And we inferred it long back, uh, even in the 1970s, if you were not to worry about the position, how distant a galaxy is, but just point, you know, look at where it is on the sky. So project all the galaxies back onto the sky. What was noticed is no part of the sky really cried out for attention. Of course, there is some graininess that you can see in the distribution. But if you have thick glasses, if you take them off, they all look more or less patchy. It's not as if the Northern Hemisphere has nothing and the Southern Hemisphere, all the galaxies. Nothing really stark was happening. So cosmology decided that uh, uh, not based on this, they decided even on, you know, uh, aesthetic or maybe simplicity grounds of building a simple model first, that the distribution of galaxies, matter around us is the same in every direction on the average. On the average, there is no solid angle or in, you know, area of the sky where there are more galaxies than another on the average, okay? And interestingly, mathematically, you have to add to this something like a Copernican principle. You also assume that we are not sitting on a special galaxy around which the universe is isotropic or looks the same everywhere. That is a possibility, but that would be a bit uh, presumptuous to think that our galaxy amongst these billions of galaxies happen to be so special. Okay, so you assume that any distant galaxy, if there was an observer, he or she would see uh, uniform distribution of galaxy or galaxies around them if they were mapping all the galaxies back on the sky. That itself mathematically leads you to postulating that the distribution of galaxies at any point in the, of time in the universe is uniform, okay? And that led to very radical things when combined with the new theory of gravitation that Einstein had proposed. So Einstein proposed general relativity, uh, the Einstein's theory of gravity, where space time actually is determined by the distribution of matter and space time geometry, you know, determines how matter moves there. And that interesting interplay, if you apply general relativity to a uniform distribution of matter on cosmic scales. Okay, this is something that I do for my opening classes in cosmology. You can see that it immediately leads to something phenomenally you know, amazing. It leads us to an universe that is inherently dynamic. We cannot have a space time where space is not changing with time. Okay, in fact, it was so uh, radical 
uh, conclusion that Einstein himself, you know, kind of rejected it and tried to balance this expansion out by introducing something called a cosmological constant. And that's the whole story in itself uh, that it's come back to, you know, haunt all theoretical physicists of the current generation. But uh, we were led to an expanding universe. And the fact, as I should emphasize, the experiments tell you what is correct. And Hubble's uh, observations uh, showed that galaxies indeed are receding away from us. So if you have a distribution, uniform distribution here, shown to be uniform distribution of galaxies shown in this lattice of black points, the way to imagine the expansion of the universe is the entire fabric on which you have painted these galaxies is stretching out. So it's like a rubber membrane which magically can stretch with time. And then it will just take the points and move them at larger and larger distance as the membrane stretches. This immediately also resolves one of the, uh, you know, very common misconceptions people have that the universe is actually expanding around a center point. And this is largely also kind of, um, kind of reinforced by this uh, serials of um, cosmology, which starts by showing Big Bang as a loud explosion of something expanding out. That's not what is happening. Every point in the universe, the space is expanding in time. And so if there are two objects which are at the same point in space, they will move apart in time. And this is the picture of the universe, an expanding universe. So this itself, you can see that uh, revolutionary theory of gravity applied on cosmological scales to the most simple version of cosmology where you have all matter, you know, kind of homogeneously distributed immediately leads to something radically exciting, right? Which is, um, you know, kind of an expanding universe. And here, this is uh, showing you what kind of phenomena you see in this universe. So you can see that the two green galaxies, uh, a burst of radiation came out simultaneously from them. And what you can see is this red dots where this light is traveling along, you know, across space. And you can sort of clearly see as the space expands, light seems to be struggling to move, right? So things are kind of uh, in an expanding background have very unique things like that. The light covers more distance in the first instances and then struggles to cover similar, you know, between two galaxies, you would have traveled from one galaxy to the other in a very short time, but now, it would take a long time to get from one galaxy to the next. The lattice has expanded. So the challenge is more, there are more distance to cover. Okay, and these are many of the things that you have to get used to when you do cosmology. But what I want to emphasize is cosmology is just physics in this expanding arena. It is our own basic physics that you do in your labs. And I will try to emphasize that as we go along. So this leads to the simplest models of cosmology. And amazingly enough, we think that's enough, okay? So it's a universe that is growing according to some function of time. The, as the expansion happens, the expansion is given as a function of time by one of these curves. So it could have expanded up to a particular point and then contracted and fallen back on itself. It can expand forever, but uh, steadily going to a constant, uh, you know, a zero rate or constant rate, or it could be a universe that is expanding faster and faster at a faster and faster rate with time. And our job is assuming that the universe is as simple as this. Can we tell, say which universe are we living on? And the amazing story that I'll tell you is we do know that, right? And I will. And that leads to, that can be easily determined because the equations become very simple in this simple universe. You need to know how much of matter actually clusters under gravity. What is the curvature of space? 
and if, if there is matter which does not cluster under gravity now that is something that we are not aware of nothing in our you know known physics actually tells you that there is matter of that kind i won't say known physics of course we know there is an effect of vacuum energy seen in casimir effect and so something like that vacuum energy is some matter which does not cluster under gravity okay also this funny constant that uh, not uh, which was allowed by einstein's theory which einstein introduced to keep the universe from expanding actually is also can be thought to be something which is a non clustering matter okay it's a good uh, way it, you know it, it, it's you can create one for the other okay and there are remarkable effects of this expanding universe that helps us explore the universe so one of the effects is if i carry identical clocks on two galaxies distant from each other this is an observer and a distant galaxy suppose the and a clock time clock actually if you know cesium clock or anything they actually emit a particular frequency of light so let's assume that this galaxy that clock sends that cesium light signal here okay what is a light signal it is essentially periodic crests of light coming to you so let's draw that picture in terms of this is one take another take another take of the clock on on this distant galaxy and here i'm comparing it with the takes of a cesium clock now you can see by the time light has come here there are two takes for every take here right so what does it mean it would as feel as if the light that it was emitted here has half in frequency while traveling this distance so light from distant galaxies appears red shifted to us okay and which also is in some sense you know what hubble tried to saw he saw that light from distant galaxies were red shifted and in the initial period there is another effect which gives you red shifted light which is called doppler effect where something is moving away from you the light that comes is red shifted okay and this was uh, that's why people talk in terms of velocity of those galaxies as if those velocity the galaxies are radially moving away from you but red shift as understood in terms of cosmological uh, expansion gives you a unique tool to peg the distances to distant objects we obviously cannot put a meter scale in the universe to measure distance to a distant galaxy the way we infer that the galaxy is very far is from the red shift of light then another effect that happens in an expanding universe is uh, very interesting here so if i look at a box of the universe i draw an imaginary box there are galaxies strewn around of course with the expansion of the universe the box becomes bigger so it becomes twice its size and again twice its size here okay so now look at the density of galaxies relative to the density of galaxies here the density of galaxies in this box which is half the size is 18 and here it will be 1 by 64 right so then of this right so this is falling off as the third power of the size of the box right but if i were to imagine the universe having a radiation background background of radiation like i have drawn here the radiation of course the number of photons will do the same as the number of galaxies but however you notice that as you go back to an earlier universe relative to light here this is at a higher frequency i told you that as the universe expands light redshifts right so this is half the frequency here this is another half of that frequency so frequency is 1/4 here and then in addition you have 1 what 64 times the redshift so you already see that density of radiation falls off as the fourth power uh, of uh, the size of the box 
Now, why is that important? Uh, that's very important. Uh, I find that's one of the amazing things about an expanding universe is even if we start with the universe at this point where we see that the amount of matter in the galaxies, if I convert it into energy by multiplying it by C square and then compare it with the radiation density, it's 10 to the power of four times the radiation density. I'll tell you where we know the radiation density from in a few minutes. But the fact that this radiation density falls off faster with uh, expansion of the universe means in the past, when the universe was 10,000 times smaller, the density of radiation was the same as the density of matter. And for all times before that, the universe was essentially dominated by the density of radiation. Okay, so you can forget what all matter is there in the universe and focus on what is the radiation content of the universe. Okay, now that's a very wonderful wish to have. In fact, that's also a quest. And that was a quest that people had started in on uh, from sort of late 50s with the radio telescopes. And uh, as uh, uh, Professor Raghavan uh, mentioned that it was discovered in uh, 1965, what, 64, uh, 65 probably it was uh, published. The Bell Labs had an antenna which they wanted to you know, build uh, for different reasons and they could not get rid of a noise. Uh, and the noise seemed to be there all through the time, all through the, wherever you pointed the telescope, whatever you did, they could not get rid of the noise. And then, about a few kilometers from there in Princeton, uh, there was a group of cosmologists actually building radio antenna to detect a cosmic background. And these guys happened to detect it before them, right? And so Penzies and Wilson discovered quite by serendipity, uh, the dominant radiation content of the universe. I, it's dominant so dominant that it accounts for about 99% of the radiation in the universe. Uh, so almost all the radiation that you can think of in the universe is actually contained in this cosmic background. And it is actually, you would think, oh wow, so then it must be a hot one. It, it is currently not very hot. It's actually a three Kelvin. So it's three Kelvin above absolute zero, right? Three degrees above absolute zero. Three Kelvin bath. What is amazing about it, uh, which goes back to the story of this distribution of galaxies I was telling you, that this temperature is the same to a very high degree, in fact, 10 parts per million in any direction you look at. This is the strongest support for this simple model of cosmology that we built up. We built up a cosmology saying that the matter is distributed isotropically. This cosmic micro background tells you the radiation content of the universe, the dominant radiation content of the universe is actually extremely isotropically distributed. Any direction you look up to 10 parts per million, you don't see any fluctuations, okay? And this is the clinching support for this idea that the universe actually expanded from a hot dense uh, state to the current universe that we see. Okay, so I'm not sure how many of you would be familiar with this uh, space time kind of pictures, but this is one way to understand what's happening. Uh, where are we seeing this radiation from? So this is time in where, you know, it's something called conformal time where the expansion of the universe has been taken out. And this is actually co-moving space where the expansion of the universe has been taken out from the spatial coordinates. Okay, so actually galaxies move on vertical lines on this. And if I am sitting here and I look from where uh, I see, so when I see a distant galaxy, it's somewhere on what is called our backward light cone, right? Somewhere on this conical structure around us, right? On this cone. And as I go further down this cone, I'm looking at more distant and distant galaxies. At some point I have no more galaxies because galaxies have not formed. 
and then I enter a dark ages and then go back and I will see this glow. This glow appears at three Kelvin, but at this point, if I were to go with a way to measure the temperature, the temperature of the radiation there is 3300 Kelvin. And this is again based on very basic physics. If I take the dominant distribution of ordinary matter in the universe, which is largely 75% hydrogen and 25% helium, and at that densities that we have, uh, we heat it to 3300 Kelvin. We know our, from our basic physics that it will turn into a plasma. It will no longer remain neutral. The, you know, the in radiation will be hot enough to strip all the atoms of their electrons and the electrons will be freely floating around. Now what happens is then uh, electron mist kind of forms at this time, going back in time. So I'm you know, kind of running the story of the universe back. And there's this mist of electrons and you know, electrons are extremely good at scattering light. So what happens is it's like a mist. So you cannot really peer beyond it. It's like a cosmic fog. So it's a wall uh, beyond which you cannot look back in time with radiation. I mean, it's not as if radiation would not come from here, but if it comes, it doesn't carry any information because it's got so many scatters on the way that you only see when it last scattered on this surface. Okay, and this is called the hypersurface of last scattering. It's also the epoch of recombination. This is hydrogen and helium uh, atoms start, you know, beyond that, what happens is the hydrogen and helium start capturing back their electrons and become a neutral. So they don't scatter the radiation at all. Okay. And you see this cone intersects this plane in a circle. But if I look around in all directions in this two dimensional universe that I have trying to show, in every direction I will hit this circle, right? So observationally, even if you did not follow quite that picture, what you should understand is for any observer in the universe, as they look back, they're looking at a universe in the past, they can in electromagnetic radiation look back 43 billion light years away. Okay, so they can look at light, which took 43 billion years to travel here. And that light originated when the universe was only half a million years old. And if that looks too large, you should realize the universe is 14 billion years old. So this is like a baby universe that you're looking at. Okay, a day old baby compared to a hundred year old universe. Okay, and the universe is opaque beyond that. And this is what I call the super IMAX theater. We can see this entire screen all around in the sky. As Raghu said, wherever there is nothing interfering on the way with uh, the universe is, you know, if we look away from the Milky Way, more or less very sparse. And you can see the micro background all around us. Okay. And for many years, microwave background remained this flat thing. And from 65 onwards, we saw, a, you know, as we improved our sensitivity of our measurements, even then we saw that the temperature was largely the same everywhere. Okay. And it again took 25 years, again, a quest uh, to look for small fluctuations in that micro background. And that came with this, uh, why did we expect that? Because we knew that the matter in the universe was not smoothly distributed. And we, of course, it's pretty lumpy and you know, in this uh, kind of cellular structure, but we can start with very small fluctuations and grow them to this lumpy structures, but we need those fluctuations in the early universe and they should be seen in this radiation background and, uh, and which will explain this universe to us. And this was seen in 1992, okay? So this was the end of another very prized quest to look for fluctuations in the microwave background. Uh, so starting from 65 to 1990, right? And so a cosmic background explorer and a NASA satellite detected the first fluctuations in this microwave background. And it was the clue to the fact that the universe was somewhat perturbed 
in the early universe. The Mahabharat was something that had perturbed it, which perturbed the radiation. So this plasma screen was no longer smooth, but it had ripples on it, which we could start detecting. And those ripples could grow and give you the last scale structure in the distribution of galaxies that we see now. So it's a very fascinating story and of uh, you, you know, understanding our universe on scales are inconceivably big. So this 14 gigaparsec is another way of saying 43 billion light years, okay? And what you see there is a uniform background at 2.726 Kelvin, but superimposed on that are fluctuations at the level of 70 micro Kelvins, okay? Uh, root mean square. And I'll show you pictures of that. What is amazing about this story is now we understand the physics of these fluctuations very well, because the system here is very simple. It's a plasma which has been perturbed in some way, right? And our basic physics tells us what a plasma like that would do if perturbed. And what it does is it's just rings like a drum. It's, it's a, the plasma's surface is like a, you know, elastic medium. And if there are fluctuations on it, there are ripples. I often use this uh, analogy to ripples on the surface of a lake. So imagine this to be a picture of a raindrop falling on a very placid lake. Okay, what happens? The raindrop falls, there's a splotch, and then there is a ripple which runs out. Okay, if something similar happens on the plasma surface, there's this random perturbations, randomly there will be places where raindrops fall, which would be like representing the perturbations, and there'll be a ring going out. But there's something more happening to the plasma. As the wave travels, the plasma itself is turning from a plasma state to a neutral state, and it turns from red to green. And you can see that the wave actually stagnates, okay? And then the universe, nature allows us a picture taken of this ripple, you know, after it has traveled some particular distance away, okay? And it's a very precise number we can calculate to be 150 megaparsecs. Okay, so that's what we see on the plasma surface is something that we understand through basic physics and interpret it, okay? And uh, I tell you how we interpret it. So suppose I was looking at this placid lake, okay? And a raindrop falls, this happens. But suppose there's a burst of shower. So randomly raindrops fall everywhere. And I wait 10 seconds and take a picture of the surface of the water, of course. I will see basically a choppy water, right? Waves everywhere, you know, kind of all the ripples would have gone into each other. But that is where being smart uh, physicists or mathematical physicists would help. You realize that nevertheless, there were raindrops which fell and there was a ripple going around every raindrop and the ripple traveled at a particular speed. So that ripple must have only traveled say, one meter in that 20 seconds that I waited before taking the picture. And if I Fourier transform, if I look for that ripple in this fluctuation, I should be able to see it. And that's what we try to do in the microwave background. We look at something called the Fourier transform, something called the power spectrum of these fluctuations of the plasma surface. And we see these ripples out there. What is amazing about that is this ripples very sensitively depend on what is your assumption about the amount of matter in the universe, ordinary matter in the universe, what's the total amount of matter in the universe, what's the expansion rate of the universe, and various parameters. And you can see that the curve sensitively moves around. So it stands to reason that the day we measure these curves, we will be knowing these parameters very well. And we also understand the physics. So we know which parameter drives which uh, shape in this ripple. So this ripple, uh, this uh, you know, wiggle that you see here is not a random wiggle. It's made out of very beautiful resonant peaks at very specific distances uh, in uh, you know, the harmonic space. And that is very easy to interpret. 
So what is underlying it is this very specific size of the ripple. And that, that is what is reflected in these waves. It's, it's no different in physics from the resonance tube experiment that you do here. But that is enough to tell us a lot about the universe. So for example, the simplest thing we can tell is the amount of ordinary matter in the universe. See, the ripple is formed of ordinary matter interacting with radiation. Anything which clusters but is not interacting with electromagnetic radiation, which we call cold dark matter, we believe something like that exists, that will not partake in this ripple. So the amount of ordinary matter that is there will determine how strong the ripple is. Okay, the height of the peak of this angular power spectrum. And we already knew that if it was uh, the kind of densities of 5% of ordinary matter in the universe that we expected from other uh, studies, we would expect this peak to be at 74 microkelvins. In fact, a decade before 1990, even when I started my research, it's a very interesting thing about 1990s when I started my research career and with the COBE measurements. And so before that already people had ruled out the possibility that the universe was entirely made of baryonic matter because this peak would have then been much higher. Okay, so ordinary matter could not have constituted all the gravitating matter in the universe is something that we knew even before uh, COBE discovered fluctuations. The other thing that COBE allowed and the COBE did not, but uh, future experiments allowed uh, is to determine the curvature of the universe. Because remember that I'm looking at a very specific scale embedded in a surface, in a plasma screen. It's like as if there's a ruler painted on this surface 43 billion light years away. Now, if I draw an ordinary triangle, I know the two sides because they are the same 43 billion light years. I know this to be 150 megaparsec. I should be able to tell you what the angle should be, right? Basically from my basic geometry. However, there's a catch. Einstein's theory tells you that the space through which light is traveling need not be your ordinary flat space where angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. It could be something with a hyperbolic curvature or negative curvature where this angle would be smaller than expected or it could have been the surface of a ball like a spherical geometry where this would have been a larger angle. And then given the location of the angular size of this ruler on the sky, we can determine the geometry of the universe, spatial geometry of the universe. So observationally, we had uh, the Cosmic Background Explorer, which opened up this field. Then the next decade was taken up by Wilkinson Microwave and Isotropy Probe, which uh, uh, you know, sort of got these fluctuations at a much higher resolution. And then the subsequent decade was dominated by PLAM, which took the most accurate uh, possible picture of the fluctuations in the temperature that you can measure. Okay, uh, I think uh, you can't get much better than Planck going forward with temperature fluctuation, but there is something more that you can. And I should also mention, which Raghu did, that there are many, many, many ground-based and balloon-borne experiments all through the time. But these three space experiments sort of are milestones in this whole discovery space. And so we have a picture of the plasma screen. This is the entire sky around us in microwave background. The average temperature of three Kelvin is taken out. Then you see these fluctuations. And you can see the fluctuations range from minus 300 to 300 microkelvins in this blue and red uh, patches. Okay. And you can convert it into uh, a distribution of fluctuation strength at different angular scales called the angular power spectrum, which I told you it's a Fourier domain object. And Planck allows you to measure this over almost all scales, starting from the largest scales that you can conceive, 180 degrees, to you know, scales of you know, tens of arc minutes. And then with extreme precision, so you can see that these measurements 
almost don't seem to have an error bar. Here you can see the error bars, but here you almost can't see the error bars. You have to see them by looking at the points and subtracting the best fit model. Remember I showed you that every model predicts a red curve, something like this red curve. And one of them fits the curve the best. And that is our model. And that model is actually a, a model that is flat geometrically. And it also tells you that the amount of clustering matter plus amount of non-clustering matter is one. And we already knew by then from other observations, particularly of the distribution of galaxies, that amount of ordinary matter cannot add up to one, okay? Just like I, you know, so I said 0 0.05 of that, 5% of that is ordinary matter. We knew absolute, only another 25% can be cold dark matter and the total thing should add up to something like 0.3. And that is the universe we see where the last scale structure in the distribution of galaxies that we observe matches, if we start off with fluctuations that we see in the micro background, run it forward with using our best simulation tools, it is not this kind of a universe, this kind of universe that we see. This universe has no non-clustering matter, no cosmological constant. And you can see that this is what we see, this is not what we see. And this is done, of course, more quantitatively, but you can even read this out from the micro background itself, right? And what we know is the universe does not have curvature and matter and uh, this thing is kind of distributed. Ma clustering matter and non-clustering matter is distributed in 30, 70 kind of ratio. And this is another way to show how micro background itself would, Planck data itself tells you that. Here's the Planck data uh, in green. And this black curve is a prediction of one of the simple models with different values of the amount of ordinary matter, cold dark matter, expansion rate. And then you allow all of the parameters of the universe, the six parameters of the universe that you allow to vary simultaneously and look for a combination which gives you a curve that actually threads to all the data points. And you can find that these are, you know, interesting search algorithms which uh, look for that. And then you find that there's a particular combination and that is what tells you that the amount of cold dark matter and the baryonic matter add up to about 0.3 and the rest of it must be made up of something that's non-clustering and the best answer we have at this point is the cosmological constant. I wanted to emphasize again that the physics that we have used to infer this is not speculative, not anything that we don't understand and not tested in lab. With that itself, we understand the constituent of the universe to about percent level accuracies, okay? So we know the amount of ordinary matter to a percent, amount of dark matter to about a couple of percent, expansion rate to a percent and a half, you know, so it's an amazing story. Yet, so we have a simple universe, but it's exotic. We are forced to accept that 95% of the energy density of universe is in a form which we don't know. So cosmology is just beginning, it's not ending. We have you know, understood some things, but there are more questions than answers here. So what is it? We believe that 30% of this is made up of something that clusters, but does not interact with light. So cold, cold dark matter and something that also does not interact with light, but is smooth form of energy, which acts kind of repulsively under gravity. And that is called dark energy, okay? Or it could be the cosmological constant. So that is our current understanding and we have a long way to go forward. Hence, you know, you should look forward to the decades of cosmology ahead. I would focus on one of the parts, which is that you realize that in inferring all this, I use the fact that the plasma surface was perturbed. Now, the question you would ask is what perturbed the surface of the plasma in the first place? So again, this picture shows you this cosmic screen where all the microwave background radiation is coming from. We know how these tiny perturbations can 
turn into this distribution of galaxies. And that is possible if you allow for the particular values of the cold dark matter and baryonic matter and expansion rate and you know, the whole cosmological model. If you give that, you can explain this part. But you still have to explain where these fluctuations arose in the first place. And we have a very exotic you know, paradigm or thought about what, what happened. We believe in the very, very, very early moments of the universe, there was a very phase of extremely fast, rapid accelerated expansion which stretched space-time very rapidly, about 10 to the power of 28. So 28 orders of magnitude in uh, 10 to a minus 35 seconds, right? So that kind of massive event happened. And it was so radical a stretch that it stretched quantum fluctuations to become classical fluctuations that got are now being seen in the micro background. Now, if that is true, and that is our explanation for what Planck is seeing and the micro background perturbations are seeing, the same physics dictates, okay, if we believe that the same physics, uh, quantum physics, uh, gave rise to the uh, distribution of galaxies, that same physics necessarily tells you that there will be a background of gravitational waves. Exact amount of it depends, varies from model to model. And hence the current goal of cosmology is to verify if the early, our guess about the early moments of the universe is correct. And at this point, we have only put upper limits on what it is. There was a claim detection by bicep turned out to be wrong. So we are in this regime where, you know, this number probably now is even smaller than this at 0 0.03. But we want to go down to 10 to a minus three and check it out. And it's a to do or must do for cosmology, okay? And what do we have to do? We have to peer and look at the temperature or the micro background at more sensitivity because we want to understand something very subtle. So embedded in this is basically what is happening is if there are gravitational waves generated in the early universe, they would distort this entire sphere of last scattering or this plasma screen that I'm seeing. Okay, it will distort that whole thing. Just like in, for LIGO, gravitational waves distorts the position of mirrors by 10 to a minus 18 meters, and we detect that. Here, this will distort this at the level of 10 to a minus eight, okay? And this shape, of course, in a very exaggerated form for a particular kind of gravitational waves will look, could look like this. And how do we see that? If you look at the microwave, not only is it hotter and colder in different parts of the sky, there's also a net linear polarization in any direction that you look at. And this is another observable in the microwave background called the CMB polarization. And that signal is even a 10th uh, of that, which we have seen, but there's another signal, which is another 10th or 100th of that, which we haven't, which is the stick pattern, pattern of sticks, which have a wall. Okay, and this is a telltale signature of primordial gravitational waves generated in the early moments of the universe. Okay, to do this, we need to actually, you know, get experiments that dig deeper. So till now, if this is the, you know, power in fluctuations in uh, the microwave background as angular in and uh, plotted with angular scales, and these are the predictions. This is the predicted temperature fluctuation. This is one kind of polarization, which I told you is one tenth of this, but then this one is uncertain, but this is about a hundredth of this or even a thousandth of this, okay? And for that, at this point, our satellites were good enough to map these out in the cyan band. We need more sensitive satellites, which will see these green curves and tell us uh, the signal of gravitational waves from the very origin of the universe. So to do that is an amazing quest uh, that is underway all around the globe. And in India, the Cosmology Consortium proposed to the Indian Space Research Organization, a satellite which we dubbed ECO, Exploring Cosmic History and Origin, which will be kind of the best possible CMB satellite you can imagine. 
it would have uh, you know mapped the sky in many many wavelengths which is required to you know clean out other emissions and then it will have unprecedented sensitivity accuracy and angular resolution and the scientific returns is kind of mind boggling if you heard the nobel prize lectures by from the three people who won the nobel prize for gravitational wave detection two of them explicitly mentioned that the next big breakthrough in this a quest is seeing the gravitational waves from the big bang or from the quantum origin of the universe right and it is basically uh you know something that they also see as the next big challenge in front of us uh revise in particular was a person who worked on the cobe satellite in his early days before he took over the ligo uh and uh, this also in doing so on the side we will discover a lot of neutrino physics we will also map out the dark matter distribution very very accurately we will have a much more accurate idea of how much baryons is there and where they are in the entire observable universe so it will be improving our understanding of cosmology by you know in some what is called figure of merit by 10, 10 million right it would be amazing and it would also spew out a lot of galactic and extra galactic astrophysics and there's of course any time you you know venture into unknown territories of sensitivity you may have surprises unexpected discoveries so what is the sensitivity that we are you know or what is the frontier of sensitivity that we are breaching this is the sensitivity of measurement of power now in day to day life we hear power of 1 megawatt which is kind of when you're talking about how much power is generated uh, somewhere to milliwatts which are in various uh, you know say your laser pointer and things like that but your cell phone itself is an interesting uh, device it measures when you you know hear the signal i mean when you hear of uh, get a phone it amplifies the signals which it receives picowatts okay this itself is very surprising it means your uh, you know the cell phone uh, if you can see this is actually a very very good microwave receiver right but at of course much higher frequencies than what we are looking at uh, lower frequencies than what we are looking at for uh, cmb we need to breach this so picowatts or tenths of a picowatt is readily possible and those were actually the detectors that were developed for the cmb experiments in the early 90s the 5g that you are having sorry uh, is actually uh detectors that were built for you know cmb studies and similar very sensitive detectors in the late 1990s okay now the detectors we are talking about would each measure at a watt of power right 10 to a minus 18 so you are trying to breach this you know level of sensitivity that you can have to power and you have to put this array of detectors on to a plane look at the sky reflect the incoming cmb radiation onto it and measure it with such sensitivity so as to see this very tiny signal that we're looking for now what is the challenge of such a mission you see that such detectors work at this sensitivity only if they are kept at a millikelvin temperature hundreds of you know uh the point 1 millikelvin temperature and then this is uh, a satellite which is facing the sun away from the sun but the solar cells need to be charged so this is at about room temperature at one side so you have to make sure that your design is such that it separates this hot phase from something which is at this small temperature okay at high 100 microkelvin yeah Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, finish soon so that we have time for questions. Oh yeah, sorry. I think I have uh, overrun a lot. Yeah, sorry. I didn't realize that. So these are uh, uh, arrays of detectors that we will have to find uh, uh, place 
and we'll have to place maybe thousands of detectors in various possibilities. And such detectors exist, such sensibilities exist in labs. And these are pictures of detectors that are being placed in ground observatories. And we will put it all on a satellite. And we propose to ISRO that its most uh, capable launch vehicles, ESLV Mark III, will take the satellite all the way to the second Lagrange point, you know, away from the Earth Moon system, away from the sun, and where it will park and look at the sky and scan and measure the microwave background. So I'll stop uh, with this final slide. So in 2009, this is the picture of the spacecraft, Arian spacecraft, which carried the Planck satellite. Uh, and it's been more than a decade and we are still awaiting the next CMB space mission. And hopefully ISRO, uh, given the enthusiasm of the young crowd in, the in, in India for this quest, would agree to be the one which takes a lead role in this. Thank you. I'm sorry for going over time. I think I didn't quite look at the time, yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot, Tarun. Mm -hmm. uh, this was very interesting. You took us through the history of CMB as well as the physics of CMB. Um, so we have time for some questions. So let me just go through the questions that have come in the chat box. Uh, people have been writing along the way. Uh, should I stop sharing now or? Uh... Uh, unless you want to show something. Okay, uh, fine. You can ask the questions. So, uh, there's a question from Shruti Tiwari. Could you please explain how you took a galaxy as a basic unit? Okay, so as I explained to you, I mean, when we look at a system on a large scale, so for example, if you're looking at the, you know, flow of air in a room, the particles, individual particles, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, you don't really worry about what are the molecules of the air made of, or what is the, even if you are monitoring the movement of dust particles, we don't worry about whether it's a dust, of you know cement or dust of some you know food food particle or something, but anything that's floating in the air. Similarly, the galaxies sort of dot the universe, and they are like traces of how the space is expanding in time. So they are like just traces. All I meant was there are people who actually work on the structure of galaxies, and that's an entirely different field. But I just wanted to set that for us in this quest that we are looking at or cosmology, understanding cosmology, the structure of individual galaxies does not really matter so much. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess what you're saying is that on the scales at which we are looking, the galaxy is, is very small. Yes. Like a dot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then there's a question. Um, why are the error bars? Um, one thing in, Oh, why are the error bars so high in low multipoles as compared to high multipoles? Uh, he's talking of your plot of the angular power spectrum of the CMB. And does yeah. it indicate some hidden physics or is it just systematic error? Uh, this is a kind of interesting error. This is coming from what I, is also known as sample variance in the sense that if you have limited, you know that observations improve with the number, I mean, errors go down with the number of observations independent observations. Now, if I have less number of observations, your error bars will be larger. Here, essentially at low multiples, we have less number of observations, but that's not because we are being lazy there and we are not being lazy at higher multiples. It's just that number of points on the sky separated by those large angles is much lesser than number of pairs of points separated by small angles, right? So there are, less points to measure differences of temperature from when you are looking at big angular separations, okay? It may be a bit difficult to think about it, but think of uh, two points on the sky, which are very small distance apart and two points which are antipode of each other. Number of antipodes will be just the number of pointing directions that you have, right? But um, uh, even if given the number of pointing directions, the number of neighboring pointing direction pairs that you can have is much more. So this is something that is inherent because we are measuring the temperature on a finite surface of a sphere. Sphere has a finite surface and hence it's got a grand name called cosmic variance. 
but it essentially tells you that there is a inherent limitation of how well you can measure the temperature fluctuations at low l and in fact planck has measured things so well that up to 2000 a multiple of 2000 these error bars are dominated by what is the cosmic variance the instrumental noise doesn't come in at all it comes in beyond that all these are cosmic variance dominated error bars um thanks now there's a question from akhil uh, munda plakar does one form of matter ever convert to another for example does cold dark matter convert to a different form of energy there are people who have proposed models where um, dark matter decays but there are very severe limits on that and actually these limits can become even more stringent or we may discover a decaying dark matter at a very subtle level uh with uh, something like eco because eco besides measuring the cmb polarization is also designed to have spectral capability so it will actually measure the thermal history of the universe and be able to detect uh, such scenarios so it is possible but not in it's not considered in the simplest models because we don't need that complication at yet to explain anything Uh, there's a question from Alan Kuriokos. Uh, do you have any comments on new studies which suggest that the universe might be anisotropic on large scales? Yes. So uh, my own research uh, as a part of Planck has been to try and make sure that uh, there isn't a big signal on that. There is some tentative or you know intriguing evidence that there are fluctuations of the microwave background seem to be. higher on one side than the other uh, but again because of this cosmic variance of large angular scales it's never possible to kind of very conclusively say that there is such signal okay and that signal is some you know result of any real physics it could be just by chance right uh, there's a question from hv raghavendra on the note of cmb polarizations we have sensitivity curves of current and upcoming gravitational wave emissions such as pta or lisa um can we have estimates or upper bounds of these polarization amplitudes detectable by future cmb emissions from these curves sorry uh, i mean friend and sir i'm not sure on the note of cmb for the so when Yeah, so that show something with can we lisa? have estimates um or on, on these polarize of these polarization amplitudes detectable by future cmb emissions from these curves i think perhaps you know where you showed the uh, ttt uh, te bb curves yeah this one yeah. and then the next slide showed um, what experiments have been able to see so far okay. no no i uh, so this is yeah so this is what we have been able to explore and this is very rough kind of a drawing of what has been the sensitivity of the current planck mission the cyan uh, band here and this is how, how much more sensitive we need to get to measure this right but uh, i i didn't get the lisa part of it actually yeah no, um, yeah because we haven't See, really is, gone yeah. into that in yeah. this book Lisa has nothing to do with this, uh, in the sense that, of course, Lisa could, in principle, measure uh, gravitational waves from the early universe, but they're in very strange models of uh, the early universe. Uh, but in the kind of uh, run-of-the-mill models that we'll first try to look for, uh, they it's not expected to be seen by Lisa. Well, there's a, another question. Actually, you can just keep that slide, um, the previous one. Um, this is again from uh, Sharma Saurabh. Uh, will CMB Bharat be able to probe B-mode polarizations and up to how many sigma or to, to what sensitivity? Ah, okay. So I don't have those uh, real technical plots, but uh, yes, uh, CMB Bharat will see uh, its design. For uh, sensitivities of one arc minute micro Kelvin arc minute, uh, 
so that's the best sensitivity uh, des of the design we talked about. In that case, we should be able to measure part of 10 to a minus three in uh, the ratio of the gravitational waves to tens uh, you know, uh, density perturbations. R, there's a quantity called R. At this point, the limits there are 10 to a minus, uh, you know, point. Uh, zero two or something, then zero three, but uh, that can go down to much lower values. Uh, there's another question from Shruti Tiwari. Uh, what happened at the epoch of recombination? At the epoch Actually, of you could just uh, say it again. Yeah. Uh, at the epoch of recombination, what happened was uh, prior to that, the universe was hotter and the universe became colder. And what is the transition? The transition is that hydrogen and helium was at a temperature where it was totally ionized uh, prior to recombination. At recombination, which is not an instantaneous happening, but uh, fairly instantaneous on cosmological time scales, uh, what happened was the universe became, uh, the temperature of the micro background became less than 3300 Kelvin. At that, there weren't enough photons to keep all the uh, hydrogen and helium ionized. Okay, hot enough, you know, so you need at least photons uh, with more than the ionization energy of helium and more so of hydrogen to keep them ionized. And then we didn't have that many photons. And going forward again, just because the number of energetic photons keeps dropping with, as the distribution of the microwave background becomes colder and colder. Um, so essentially all the, you know, ionized helium and hydrogen converted to neutral hydrogen and helium. The atoms caught back, uh, the nuclei caught back with their electrons and became neutral atoms. Uh, there's a question from Garima Rajguru. Is there any particular reason why the second Lagrangian point is preferred to station the telescope for this project? Yeah, so these uh, Lagrange points are quasi-stable points in a two-body uh, thing, right? So the Sun Earth uh, system. And so there are uh, Lagrange points on the orbit of Earth, as well as two, which one close to the Sun and one away from the Sun. And so L2 is the one which is radially away from the Sun. We want to be far from the sun. We want to look away from the sun. And also we, we need to stay in the same place so that the ambient uh, environment doesn't change. And that's very important for these very delicate measurements. Uh, that's where Planck was. So it's not something ultra novel in terms of going to a La second Lagrange point. Uh, there have been satellites parked there. And it's quasi-stable, so you don't need much uh, fuel to keep it in place. There's a question from Kushal Lodha. Are there any efforts in India to explore the cost correlation of cross correlation of 21 centimeter cosmology with CMB observations? Yep, um, there are, but you know, it's going to take me quite a while to tell you what I'll is happening, but yes, um, indeed, uh, there are connections to both. Okay, uh, let me just see the next. Uh, uh, okay, the next one is also related to 21 centimeter lines. So maybe we'll uh, pass on that. Hmm. Um, I have a question that I wanna ask you uh, because I know that there are uh, students of engineering also in this audience. You started off as an engineer and then you moved to physics. Uh, what advice would you give to a student of engineering who actually also has a passion for physics? Uh, number one, okay, there are two options going forward. One is, uh, as I did, you could move to physics. It's possible to do a PhD in physics starting with an engineering degree because uh, if you have done the basic physics courses in your engineering, then it's uh, not as difficult to move to physics. But I also noticed that these days, relative to my time, the coursework in uh, engineering has become much more specialized. In our times, I could take many courses in physics. 
so I would recommend then actually doing a master's and then moving to PhD. So, you know, go to a good place, do a master's and, you know, in physics and then, so it's easy to do that. But that's one route. But, you know, why I really love this quest is here you can actually be involved in a science quest as a full-fledged engineer, out and out engineer, right? You could be a civil engineer, you could be a mechanical engineer, you could be a controls engineer, you could be an electronics engineer and be actually working on act cutting edge science, right? You will be building the instrument, you will be designing things, you will be doing, okay. So that itself to me, uh, I feel could be very satisfying for many of the engineers because you're part of a scientific enterprise and you, know, you are in the scientific environment where you're you know, talking to colleagues who are doing this for their living, yet you are there as a special person because only you can deliver the instrument that uh, the scientists need. And that's very exciting. Indeed, I think you put it very well. I mean, the, there are two different paths that students can take and uh, either of them, depending on their orientation, could lead to a very exciting future for them. So we'll end here now. Uh, it's uh, quite close. Yeah, to I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. This was good. I mean, I, yeah. I think there was so much to share. Um, and so I didn't feel like stopping you at any point. I okay. hear more. So um, I'll now request... Uh, uh, Kaushiki, to share uh, a Thank you, Professor. So thank you, Professor Shardif, for being here and taking us through this interesting part, cutting edge research that is going on in India itself. And thank you all for being here. We hope that you'll be joining the upcoming sessions of this lecture series. Thank you all. <laughs>